Hello, and welcome to Explorer Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen, and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so happy to see you all here today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. Here at Explorer Classroom, we love to connect with the heart of our National Geographic community, which is our explorers. This includes those who are working on the front lines of conservation, storytelling, research, and exploration. Today, we have a special presentation geared towards pre-K through second grade learners. However, curious people of all ages will be delighted to learn from today's featured explorer for a mini lesson and time to ask your questions. But before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our viewers who are tuning in from all over the world. We've got viewers from Canada, United Kingdom, South Africa, Indonesia, Colombia, Germany, Peru, Italy, Virginia, Connecticut, Maryland, Arkansas, Texas, Washington State, Georgia, Massachusetts, Illinois, Missouri, Washington DC, Kentucky, Arizona, New Jersey, New York, Alabama, Utah, North Carolina, California, Mississippi, New Hampshire, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Montana, Colorado, Kansas, Oregon, Nevada, Nebraska, Minnesota, Florida, South Carolina, Ohio, and more. Now, I would like to introduce Ian Strachan. Ian is a naturalist and storyteller whose interests include photography, cold water diving, drone piloting, and animal behavior. Ian spends a majority of his time as a naturalist helping people understand natural history, which is why he loves exploring polar regions by ship and introducing people to the wonders of glaciers and the animals that live nearby. In 2018, Ian created a documentary with the Sum Dumb Glacier Project called Blue Ice, White Thunder, which is a part of his grant work with National Geographic and which is linked in our family guide. Seriously, if you haven't seen it yet, you need to look up the family guide, it's so good. Today, Ian will continue to tell you this story. So let's turn it over to Ian to get us started. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, so I am so excited to uh, have this opportunity to share some photos and some sounds and maybe some ideas uh, as we kind of get to figure out this story together. I wanted to kind of share a little bit about um, what I do. And so uh, to start with that, we're going to kind of talk about glaciers as a thing. And I'm sure everyone kind of maybe has a rough idea, uh, or maybe you don't, that glaciers are, are really cold and about ice. And uh, that's what our story is going to be about today. And um, yeah, so like uh, Jennifer was saying, I'm a photographer. So here you can see, you know, I'm out there in the field, really uh, putting myself into, a, you know, pseudo silly situations to maybe take certain photos here. You can see I'm in, those, in these waves uh, with my very expensive camera, which if it gets wet, makes a really great paperweight and not much else. Uh, luckily, I, I still have it today, so it's still, it's still safe. So even if it was to be a paperweight, we're set. But I put myself in these little positions because there's all sorts of really cool life. Uh, here you can see, you know, I'm I really, again, dangerous situations uh, with these very, very scary animals. This is a, this is a baby elephant seal. Uh, and so it's uh, very curious. And so it would come up in the waves when I was there and come and check me out. So they're very engaging. Uh, again, another very fearsome, scary creature, which you can see uh, that I've been brave enough to get close to. This is an Antarctic fur seal pup. Penguins are another thing that are all over uh, Antarctica and especially very close to glaciers sometimes. But I don't just work in the colder areas. You can see I have to protect my camera from all sorts of animals. This is an orangutan. This is in Indonesia, which I think we have some viewers from there. And so you can see, you know, very, very fixated on trying to take, 
take the camera to take the photos maybe of me. I'm wearing a, a face mask here, which is really important to keep the, the this is in an, a specifically in an orphanage uh, for these orangutans and that keeps um, them from having to worry about getting sick. It's very important. You can see you can move them around really easily if you, if you put them in a, uh, you know, industrial transportation vehicle. But there's so many fun photos and so many interesting animals out there in the world. And uh, that's part of my job is to get to share uh, and show and describe and then capture moments to, to make sure that people see that. And there's so much above the water, but there's also a lot below the water. And so here you can see the photo of me where I'm about to go underwater scuba diving. And this is in Alaska. So the water is pretty cold. Uh, not as cold as in Antarctica, which I do a little bit of diving there too, but this is still colder than you'd want to take a bath for sure. But there are lots and lots of life down there as well. This is actually not in Alaska, but it's in Chile. This is a little octopus and they can be really, really inquisitive and curious. And there's just so much life down there. And it's really exciting to, to make sure that you can kind of capture these moments to bring back, to share it with people maybe just on the ship that I was working on, or uh, to share these images with, with you. Here's another photo from Alaska. Alaska is a really special place. And that's what we're gonna kind of focus on a lot of. This is actually in Antarctica, but there's just wanted to show you some of the, the images of the travels that I've been doing over the last many years. And this is where we start to talk, talk about the things that we're going to be focusing on for this story. And this is an iceberg. This is down in Antarctica. This is a big iceberg. This is probably about the size of a city block. It's super, super tall. But as much as uh, we could talk just about that one iceberg, what I want to talk about is the story that we're going to talk about today and tell. And that starts with just a single snowflake. So for this whole story, we're going to talk about glaciers. You're going to take the kind of perspective of a tiny little snowflake. Uh, because that's where it all starts in terms of glaciers. So snow, maybe some, not everyone lives in an area where it snows, but I'm, you probably are familiar with the topic. So it's going to snow and that snow starts to accumulate down and build up and build up. And, and if it doesn't melt, then it stays there. And then the next time it snows, more snow, snow uh, snows on top of that. And that's a really uh, important thing that, that it lasts and persists because it's going to build up and if it's in an area like Alaska or Antarctica or Greenland where that doesn't freeze, where it persists, where it lasts from season to season, that snow starts to pile up and pile up and pile up. And this is kind of the end result. So we're kind of seeing the two ends of this bookshelf. Uh, and then we're gonna kind of figure out the story in between how the snowflake turns into an iceberg. So, like I said, we're gonna talk uh, about a glacier system in uh, Alaska. And um, does everyone know where Alaska is? If you don't, you could maybe point to it. I'm sure you mostly got it right. But uh, here, I'll zoom in a little bit for you. Oh, that's too far zooming in. Uh, but there's, there's uh, a campsite that I was working on here. I'll zoom out a little bit more. I think there's Alaska. And do you see all the little white bits on this Google Earth map? So that's snow, as you would probably expect. And that's snow that you can see from space. And that snow is just there and it lasts. It, it lasts throughout the winter not in, and in, into the summer. So the more snow that accumulates, that builds up, uh, the, kind of that's over time gonna add more and more snow on top of it. And then what happens is as that snow gets so heavy, there's so much snow on top of it that it's, pushes it down. If you've ever played with ice or a snow to make a snowball, you know how it's kind of fluffy, but then you can kind of press and squeeze it down and it kind of gets harder and, and heavier and you just kind of squeeze that and pile more on top and top and top. And you can push it down. And that's what's happening with just the weight of so much snow on top. And it gets so heavy that that snow turns into ice as you're just pressing it down so much. This is where, uh, this is where that little photo of me was around there. Make it a little jiggle a little bit. But uh, this is kind of the end of that glacier. 
So that snow, what happens is it accumulates up way in the mountains and, it, and it's really just kind of like a lake. That ice field just accumulates and builds up and builds up and builds up until it builds up so much that it presses down and turns into ice. And then after you squeeze ice so, so much, you can't squeeze ice anymore. It's, it's, it's already as, as compacted, as squished down as it's ever gonna be. So the only thing that it can do is move downhill. And so that's where we have that lake of ice, essentially. And that glacier becomes the river from the lake that comes all the way down and it's gonna meet the ocean or it's gonna to try to. And then this is what you see at the end where this is, this is salt water that you can see here. And if this glacier has been able to move all the way through this landscape and carve itself a path all the way down to try to find the ocean. And so it's constantly flowing like a river from a lake, moving, moving, moving all the time. And so what I was doing for my, my grant project with National Geographic was I was trying to, to document uh, kind of the end state of what happens with these glaciers and what is going on in this one specific place in the world. And to do that, I was using a drone, which I'll probably show you guys at the end. You can see the little drone here above the ice. There's a little robot that I, I'm essentially flying from a remote controller that's attached to my phone or an iPad so I can see it zooming around because I'm putting it into areas uh, where, where I don't wanna be myself or I can't be, which is maybe a hundred meters above, uh, above a big, huge wall of ice. As we've already established, I'm only really brave when it comes to getting close to baby animals. So you can kind of understand why I wanna use a robot. But this is all the gear that we would use uh, you can see the, really on the, the bottom left here, there's lots and lots of batteries. And these batteries are uh, really crucial because the drone can only stay up for so long and we would send it back and forth and back and forth and put in a fresh battery. So again, what happens with these glaciers, these rivers of ice, they've carved down. You know how a river might make bends and turns and twists. The same thing is happening with these glaciers. And what they're doing is they're winding through and carving through these big mountains. And then once they start to carve a certain way, they can carve more and more and more. And so here is a glacier, this is a glacier in Antarctica, but you see how it kind of, that it's all ice, but it's oozing down, it's moving uh, down. You can kind of see how it looks like it's melted and kind of coming down. Now it's not necessarily melting right here, but even though it's ice, it's still acting like a solid, uh, like a liquid, sorry. And that's really important to kind of wrap our heads around because even though it's a solid, it's acting kind of like a liquid. And to do that, to show an example of that, I have a very scientific instrument here, which is a generic candy bar, which if you're really good and for science, you could probably ask whoever maybe has the ability to find you one of these that you could maybe figure out how to how to do this replicate this science experiment. So what you're going to imagine is if since we're all scientists now you can imagine that this is a glacier so this is kind of the uphill and this is the downhill and so it's moving down and if you you can see how it's all kind of wrinkly a little bit on top but it's mostly kind of it's all the chocolates melted on top that's the same thing that happens with the ice and as the glacier moves downhill you can see, see how it starts to crack and crumble. And so that's what's happening there as I get it off of my keyboard. Uh, but that kind of crackling and crumbling is exactly what happens as that glacier was frozen. It was a flat kind of perfect uh, lake. And as it comes down, the kind of the rapids that occur along that river of ice start to, um, start to kind of crumble and crack. So you can see when I go back to my, my little photos here. Stand by. So you can see that kind of example of that. See how this glacier has all these cracks and little, we call them crevasses. And so that's what you're seeing. You're looking right down on top of that Snickers bar or could be any candy bar uh, that goes down and, and is going downhill. And what you're seeing there is all those cracks and uh, out in the crevasses of that glacier. As it's moving downhill, it's kind of crumbling a little bit. 
And so here's another photo. This is a glacier in, in Antarctica. And you can see how, see how it's kind of smooth in one spot and then it kind of, as it starts to go downhill, when it starts to fall off into the ocean, what you're seeing there is that kind of crumbling and it's kind of starting to crack and, and fall apart a little bit. So again, that kind of river comes down and then falls off into the ocean. So this is the, uh, the glacier that I was studying. This is Leconte Glacier in Southeast Alaska. And so I've climbed out onto the edge of this little fjord to get a bit of a better look just to um, kind of explore around here. And so you can see that that edge of the glacier comes and makes a wall. Now I bet you're probably thinking, why is that so blue? And the ice is really that color. It's really, really cool. What happens is, you know, the same reason that the, you know, it's for the same reason that the ocean and the water that we see in a, in a lake might look blue. It's really, uh, it's essentially the light is penetrating in and pushing into that ice. And the clearer the ice is, the bluer it's gonna look. And so when I was, remember when I was talking about how that snow kind of squishes down and makes, it turns the snow into ice. Well, it doesn't do it 100%. There's always gonna be little air bubbles in there. And if there's more air bubbles, uh, it's gonna look a little bit whiter. And if there's fewer air bubbles, it's gonna look bluer and bluer. So the clearer that ice is, it's gonna look super, super blue. And so you can often see that when it gets into the water and turns into an iceberg even, and there's these fresh icebergs that have been polished by the water and they can get really, really beautiful. And they can look all sorts of crazy shapes. And I think, you know, this could look like a dragon or an iguana or all sorts of animals, but you can kind of see all these wild shapes that these glaciers can, can take or the icebergs can take as they fall off the glacier. And again, you can see how clear this ice is. And because it's so clear, it starts to look blue. Here's an especially clear piece with uh, an individual that we sometimes let touch ice. Uh, but you can see he really, really likes it. Uh, but that's how clear it is. But even with that clear, you can see a couple little bubbles in there. So just think about those bubbles because we're gonna come back to that later on. But that's what, uh, that's what this ice has uh, become after it's been squeezed down by all that snow on top of it. So this is what snow can, ha can, can uh, turn into when you just press it, press it down. Okay, so as this river uh, of ice is kind of moving through this landscape, it's, it's also kind of making a bigger, a bigger space for itself. So imagine if, if we're all little snowflakes and we're been pressed together and we turn into ice and we're moving down a hallway and we're all bunched, uh, bunched in super tight and if we're moving down a hallway, but the hallway is not very big, we're gonna to have to kind of squeeze and press and it's gonna take, it's gonna slow us down as we're going and that's gonna take a long time. Uh, and that's fine because we're not in a big rush. But what happens is if we were to do that for maybe thousands of thousands of years, just moving down this hallway in this very uh, specific hypothetical situation, uh, we would start to maybe start to grind away and start to, to make that hallway a bit bigger. Uh, now, maybe you're thinking, Ian, that's a little silly. I don't know if I could just push against the wall a little bit and grind it down. And you're right, that's exactly the thing that happens with the ice. Ice versus rock, the rock is always going to win. So I have, if you want to ever do any little examples like that, you could take a rock and you could take a little piece of ice and you can kind of push and rub them together. And you can see like which one is going to end up being uh, the winner there and which one's going to kind of grind down and wear away. And you're going to probably find, unless you've had really interesting rock selections at your disposal, that the, the rock is going to win. And, and so uh, keeping that in mind, what's happening if you, know, is you have this river of ice moving down, it's pushing against rock, but it doesn't just use itself against the rock. What it will do is it'll sometimes scoop up and move along little rocks in with it. And so that's what will happen sometimes is the ice will freeze around little rocks as it's moving downhill all the way up, up in the mountains and it moves and it's carrying those rocks all the way down with it, down through the mountains and it's scraping and moving, trying that rock against the rock. And so that's what's doing that grinding. And that's what over thousands and thousands of years does a lot of that eroding away, that breaking down. And that's what makes that hallway bigger. And then another word for this hallway that we could use is a fjord. And that fjord uh, is what comes down 
and meets down to the ocean. So I think you can kind of think of this example of the rock is like the grit on sandpaper. So if you were to take some sandpaper, you can kind of feel how, you know, it's, if it's way different from normal paper because it's kind of got lots of, lots of friction on there. So if you were to take that and then kind of grind them together, you can see, see that's a lot, you know, maybe really noisy, uh, but that's going to be a very, uh, a very good way for it to grind down that mountain over time as it's picking up and plucking off these rocks. And it carries these rocks all the way down to the ocean. And so this is kind of the end of the end of the glacier here. And you can see all these rocks that would have started out way, way, way higher up in the mountains. And it would have, you, know, so you can see when at the end of a glacier, you can get rocks from all different, different areas that might've been over tens, hundreds of miles as this glacier has moved down. So it can be a very confusing place for geologists to try to figure out where, where it was from, but all they have to do is just go up river. And so what happens is the, the hallway, this fjord is gonna be really smooth because it's been constantly ground down, sanded down. Like if you ever play with sandpaper, which is really fun and I recommend, you can, uh, you can take uh, something in, that's kind of rough and if you sand it down over and over and over again, it gets smoother. And that's what's happening with these, these walls uh, of this hallway or the fjord. And so we're kind of here at the waterfall end of this river. And so it's, it meeting, it's coming down to meet the ocean. And what happens is after it kind of comes to the ocean, it's still, it's still a big just river of ice coming down, but it's got a bit of a drop to get to. And so you can see it does that because it's being pushed. It's being pushed constantly by all that water and that frozen ice up above in the mountains. It pushes down, pushes down, pushes down with all that snow landing on it and it compresses it into ice and that's pushing it all downhill. So it's pushing hundreds or dozens of miles, depending on the glacier of all that ice, it's pushing it downhill and it comes and meets the ocean. And then it, it bumps down into the water. So you can see all these little icebergs that are in front of this glacier. Those are all from that glacier just in the last, uh, in the last few hours. This is a look from the drone looking straight down uh, on top of this glacier, this is the face, we call it the face of a glacier because it's kind of right there. And so what's gonna happen is these pieces of ice will fall off uh, as they get pushed. Now these are really, really big. This is, you know, this is maybe a hundred meters uh, or, or, you know, so a good sense of example. These kind of, I'll kind of, I can find the, uh, so these are essentially, the. If you can see my cursor right here, that's about the size of a car, uh, maybe a really big car uh, down there. And so these are, and that's quite far away. And so it's just gonna crumble down and fall off. And that's kind of what that looks like. And so you've got something the size of a, sky, a, size of a skyscraper just falling down. And you can see that blue that's, that's so, so blue behind it because that has not been kind of eroded away or or weathered, uh, so it's all that very, very clear ice. That's why it's so, so blue, and that you can really kind of tell. Uh, and if you look super hard at the kind of the bottom of the screen here, you can see that there's tiny little dots around in the in the kind of the big splash, and those are little birds or big birds actually, and so those birds will swoop down and try to get food that has come um, is coming up from the upwelling of the water and the little food bits that they can get that are deeper down. And as this big splash happens, it'll bring up a lot. So that's gives you a bit of a sense of how big all this is. And these icebergs can be massive again. So this, this is probably the size of a car right there. So that's a big iceberg. Now, again, a little, little experiment that you could do at home is you, you know, you could take a piece of ice and I'll stop screen sharing here. So you could take, take your ice and you could take a bowl of water and not hold it over your computer. And you could put that piece of ice in there and you can see that it floats. And you can see how much of the ice is on top of the water and how much is below it. 
and it's really only about 10% of that ice cube is above the water. And that's true for every bit of ice pretty much. So it doesn't matter if it's a huge, big, big, uh, big iceberg glacier uh, or, or a tiny ice cube, it's gonna pretty much mostly be uh, that 80 to 90% of that glacier ice is gonna be below the water, which is super cool. And it's a super fun experiment to play with. So, keeping in mind that this photo of the glacier that you're seeing, there's so, so, it's a kind of a flat one, but it's, that means there's even more underneath the water. So it's a big, big piece of ice. But what I wanted to, uh, to mention as well, is I was talking about the sound that these glaciers make. So these are not quiet, quiet things. As that ice has been moving for hundreds of years, down, down, downhill, and it's gonna fall into the water. It doesn't do that quietly. So if you have your sound, you might wanna turn it up or down, depending how loud you wanna hear this. So that sound, is one of those big, big towers of ice falling down into the water, that big booming crash. And it might not have been super loud, and that's because we weren't super, super close. It's kind of dangerous. So what we were doing uh, is, this is my friend, Eric, and he and I were there, we were recording sounds as well as the video, uh, but to get the sounds, we wanted to have it be quiet. And the drone, as you might, might know, is a little noisy. So we have to do them separately. But we're sitting there in front of this glacier, a very safe distance away, and we're capturing the sounds of that. And it's uh, really, really fun just to get to sit and watch and do that from a kayak. We were doing all of our drone stuff from a small little boat because this was a very special uh, part of Alaska where you're not allowed to have any kind of motorized vehicle uh, on land or even above it. So we were doing everything. Uh, over the water, which was really, really uh, special to get to do. But so I, we were in this tiny little boat that a friend uh, took us out on. And you can see all these little icebergs that are all around us. Uh, and so those are all come off from that glacier that you can see uh, in the background there. And so they've all come off and they're all floating now out to sea as the tide moves in and out. And so you can see the walls of this hallway, of this fjord uh, are, are, have been kind of ground down and now that the glacier has kind of moved back a little bit, uh, life is starting to grow on there. But all these little icebergs, like I said, are just floating in and out with the tide. Sometimes they'll get stuck up on, uh, they'll come in on a high tide and the tide will drop and they'll get left there uh, on, the, on the, like just like you would have um, seaweed or something on the high tide line, you'll get pieces of ice. And so that's kind of a fun thing to see. This is the view from our campsite, which was pretty special to, to wake up to every morning. Uh, and then this is Eric again. And so we also had another uh, a microphone, but this microphone is really good at being underwater. It's called a hydrophone. Uh, and so what we would do is put that under the water. And what you'll hear here in a second uh, is this, so you can see this is the cable going all the way deep, deep down into the water. And remember all those little air bubbles that I was talking about that are trapped in the ice? Well, as this ice is melting, what happens is it's melting, 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 getting smaller. And eventually it'll kind of find a little spot. It'll melt to a spot where that one of those air bubbles was trapped. And when it gets to that point, it'll pop. And it'll make a little snap or a crackle. Uh, and we call them ice crispies. And we have a little recording here that uh, it sounds like. So this is what it really sounds like under the water in the floor with all the ice. So each little pop there is a single little air bubble, all kinds. So if you know, just imagine somebody clapping, each little pop is a clap, and that's what, uh, that's what you're hearing. All those little bits of ice are all melting, melting, melting uh, once they hit the, the ocean water, and then that's what you're gonna get. So 
again, this is another, this is the kind of a, that bird's eye view that I was able to get with these, the robot that I was using, the drone. And so it's looking straight down at one of these big kind of pillars of ice as it's gonna break off here. piece of ice was that fell in and now look at how small it looks uh, just in the water. Remember only 10% of that is showing on the top. That's uh, that's kind of the whole point of the ice right there. So Sundum project was the project that, uh, that Eric and I were doing for National Geographic there. Uh, and Sundum is the Clinket name, the local people that live in that, uh, that region of Southeast Alaska uh, for many thousands of years. Uh, and they call the sound that the glacier makes sumdum. Uh, and so that's the name for our project. But I'm not the only person that has been doing, uh, uh, has been fascinated by these glaciers. These are some high school students from the very uh, small town that's nearby the glacier. This is from Petersburg High School. And so these students have been looking at this glacier. Uh, well, not these students, but students from the high school have been looking at the glacier since 1983, every single year, the seniors uh, from this high school will, will come out and they'll measure and they'll mark where the face of that glacier is. Uh, and that way they can kind of track where, uh, where it is and where it might be going. And they write all these things down. Uh, so this book is, is older than this person. Uh, so they write down all the, all the marks and the measurements uh, and they take lots of little uh, readings with with scientific instruments that they've been practicing with for years and years. And then they go out and they spend one day uh, measuring the face of that glacier all along that fjord or that hallway. And uh, it's just so cool that they're able to do that. It's really special. They have, a, they have a really special permit to be able to go to there or from the US Forest Service. And then they go back to the classroom and they get to make these little marks on the map of where it was in one year and then they get the next year and the next year and they're able to kind of move along like that. And they are able to do all this because they're taking super precise notes and writing things down and then doing all sorts of fun math. And I like to write down little notes too in my little notebook. Uh, and we're gonna talk a bit more about that later, but that's kind of the, the, the story that I wanted to tell from uh, a, single, a single snowflake moving all the way downhill and then turning into an iceberg at the end of it. So thank you very much. Great well, questions. I know so many of you have lots of questions for Ian. And as you see, he has put his Twitter and Instagram handles here. We can ask more questions of him online. But before we go, Ian, could you just tell us how we can join in your mission? How can we have skills like you? Yeah, so uh, what I get to do for work is to travel around and help people uh, kind of get to understand the natural world, which is just a, such a fantastic thing to be able to do. Uh, but to do that, you have to kind of have uh, lots of different ways to, to understand nature and, and just the world around us. And so kind of like what I was talking about for this story, we were kind of talking about the colors of the ice and uh, the way that maybe the the uh, ice kind of scraped against the rock for that touch and then uh, the sound of the of maybe the little the rice krispies or the glacier booming so all those things those are those are senses those are things that you're experiencing and if you write those down kind of like in a journal then you'll be able to kind of come back and 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 know what it was like then kind of like for those little uh, just just like you're preserving that memory just like that air is being preserved in the ice uh, it's moving down uh, from the glacier all the way down into an iceberg. Well, I hope all of you are just as inspired by Ian's presentation as, as I have been. Um, Ian, thank you so much for being a role model to young learners and for sharing all of your knowledge with us today and your amazing photography. Um, not only has Ian taught you, but he's also a teacher of teachers. And thanks to National Geographic Education and Lindblad Ex 
petitions. Ian has been a mentor for Grosvenor Teacher Fellows like me. So Ian, thank you for being one of my teachers and thank you for helping educators be teacher strong. Also, my thank you to all, all of our, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you to all of our learners who have joined us here today. I bet you want to explore more. So you can visit natgeoed.org backslash explore classroom where you can check out our schedule and register for more live shows and an on-screen spot. Next week, we'll return with another broadcast just for your age group with volcanologist and professor Jeffrey Johnson. Check out ways to get involved with the description below in the links and keep the conversation going. There were so many great questions that we didn't get to. So tag at Nat Geo Education and at Ian J. Stracken on Twitter. You can also reach out to Ian on Instagram and be sure to use the hashtag Explorer Classroom. He would be